Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> and welcome. I'm Sandy Vinoy, Dean in the Walker College of Business, and it's my honor and pleasure to welcome you to this semester's Courageous Conversations event. Straight talk on navigating the career maze, insights from black alumni. Panelists, thank you for being here to share your experiences. We are especially pleased to welcome two of our Walker College of Business alumni back to campus today. We're looking forward to what we will learn from all of you tonight. And thanks to you, our audience members, for joining this important conversation. Creating an environment of belonging and holding space for open and honest dialogue is critical to our success. Diversity, equity, and inclusion are foundational to our college's mission, vision, and values. This evening's event was created to provide just such an opportunity. We have much to discuss, much to learn, so let's get started. I now welcome our student moderators, Senior International Business and Digital Marketing double major, Amaya Crawford, and Junior Accounting major, Javon Siddle. Please join me in welcoming our moderators and our panelists to the stage. Doing well, well, great to have you here. We're welcome. Uh, well, I want to welcome you uh, for being here uh, to this Courageous Conversations event, um, an event to foster uh, just an inclusive conversation on what it's like to embark on your career journey um, as a black student, uh, a black alumni. Um, we're welcome uh, our esteemed guest here, uh, and I'll turn it to Amaya uh, for our first question. Hello, everyone. We're so excited you guys are here today. Um, we're excited to hear from our panelists a little bit about your journey. Again, my name is Amaya Crawford. I'm a senior here at App. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with our first question. To start, and this is for all of you, what is your current job title? What was your major? When did you graduate? And what was your first job after graduation? <laughs> During the demonstration. Hello everyone, my name is Kiwani Taylor. Um, I, I'm sorry, is it feedbacking? <laughs> I um, graduated in 2021. Um, my first job when I graduated, I had a psychology degree and I was an HR assistant. Currently I am a graduate student and I also work in the Office of Diversity as a climate support specialist. Hello. Hey everyone. How are y'all doing tonight? Well, my name is Tasia Lovett. I'm from High Point, North Carolina. I graduated App State in 2018 as an accounting major. Um, I, my first job out of college, I was a internal auditor at Cone Resnick, so went straight into, straight into audit work. And then currently, I am a senior internal auditor at Wells Fargo. And then outside of kind of my corporate lifestyle, I own a cheer team in Charlotte as well. So kind of live the corporate life and balance as well with a little bit of fun. Hello. All right, I don't know if I need a mic. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Cache Cook, and I obviously work for App State Police Department. Um, I currently lead the Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement Unit within the App State Police Department. Um, I also serve as the recruiter. And I graduated um, with my bachelor's in criminal justice in 2014. I started as a music major. I'm a huge uh, band geek, so for any fellow band people in here, 
Um, thank you. And that's something that stuck with me throughout my career, uh, even though policing looks a little bit different. But um, I am also currently in school again. So just finished my nonprofit management certificate and also working on my master's in public administration. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Mariah Breeze. I'm a senior solutions consultant with Genesis. I graduated in 2016 and I started out in actuarial science. Then after about year two, I pivoted to accounting. And then after year three, I finished in international business with a minor in Spanish. And um, right after college, I started working as a underwriter. Yeah, I had an underwriting internship at High Point. For that, um, we'll go into a two-part question now, and I'll start with you, Cache, actually. Um, how did you choose your career path, um, and how did your identity shape your choices and opportunities? Um, so that's, that's kind of a really interesting question for me because like I said, I started as a music major, so I had all intentions on um, being a band teacher, high school band teacher. Uh, but at the time that I was in school, there was a, a lot of cuts happening to um, the arts and music programs throughout public school systems. But outside of that, um, I had a very difficult childhood growing up. And um, you know, I, there was always help and support from police officers and people in the criminal justice uh, system. And so I wanted to be able to give that back and um, help people um, in the same way that I was helped and even in better ways than I was helped in some ways. And so that's kind of what helped shape my, my desire to get into service. Um, and of course, exploring the criminal justice degree um, definitely kind of really made me feel like, okay, this is where um, I need to be. And I love being here at App State Police. Um, my, first job was in an attorney's office um, as a legal assistant, um, but I definitely enjoy being out in the field and I love being on a college campus because there's so many personalities and people and young minds that we can impact um, in positive ways. And so I love that opportunity. And every six months, there's thousands of new people <laughs> coming in that we can have that impact on. So I love the fast paced change uh, of the institution. Did I miss something? I'm good. Okay. Great. That was great, and we'll work it inside out. Yeah. Uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, how did you choose your career path, um, and how do you think your identity shaped your choices and opportunities? Um, how did I choose it? So initially, the reason I started with actuarial sciences, I loved math and I loved business, and it was a merge between the two. Also, it was in high demand. And when I finished in international business, what happened was I did a study abroad sophomore year and it took the roof off of my house, meaning it made me question and look at America a different way, to a point where I would have sworn that I would never give birth to a child in this country, that I would not want to raise a child here because to raise a black king and queen in America is somewhat difficult, it takes, it's a different challenge. But long story short, so then when I finished in international business, the goal was get back out of this country. Um, I, my family brought me back down to life and said, no, you need to take a role for two years and then try to jump. So that influenced my career path, right? Um, and so I started out with an underwriting internship. After about six months, I then took a leap of faith and moved to New York. When I first got there, I did not have a job lined up. I literally had two, you know, like a retail at American Eagle and then, um, I uh, worked at a coffee shop called pret a in Times Square. And it took about three months to find a role, like to really find something. And I never would have thought I would have went into sales. Um, my father and I both thought, you don't really want to do sales. But turns out, that's where I find, found my first offer, which was at State Farm Insurance doing sales. And it was time for me to push the needle and just try something new try something that me nor my father thought I'd be great at. And um, I ended up doing pretty well at it. And so um, what influenced that decision was I need money, I'm in a new city, and two, um, push past your fears, right? So that's what influenced that. When I left State Farm, I was sick of, uh, no, 
When I left State Farm, I went to work at a bank on Wall Street called Municipal Credit Union as a um, assisting a loan officer. When I got there, I'm thinking, so one of the great things about App State when you are in the College of Business is they really give you a lot of sharp tools. You know, I remember attending an etiquette class. I remember being a part of a women's program with, led by Amy Odom over there. And um, th what they set you up for is to expect long days, right? That when you first start your career, you're gonna go in and you're gonna be the first one in and the last one out. But what I'm bringing that up for is that when I got to this bank on Wall Street, it was the opposite. At 4.59, people were running out the door. And I said, this is not the experience I'm looking for. This is not, you know, it sounds great, right? Oh, you work at a bank on Wall Street, guess what? Those people were not there to do what I was there to do. So it gave me a push and led me to, I was one weekend uh, looking at YouTube, figuring out how do you get back abroad when you're not working for an actual company. And so I figured out a way to become an au pair. And that led me to take a role in Spain as an au pair, working with a family. An au pair is just a nanny that lives in. So uh, when I came back, I thought, time to go to grad school. And then after grad school, uh, there was, it was 2020 uh, when I graduated. So the market was very, very tough. When I went to grad school, the goal was to pivot. I do not want to do sales anymore. I do really well at it. However, I don't want to do cold calls. I don't want to have the pressure of a quota. I want to go to business school, make this money count, and be able to get something that allows me to live a little bit more seamlessly. Well, you know, when you think you have a plan, how often does that work, right? So um, when I finished grad school in 2020, because the market was really tough, didn't like any of the offers that I got. So then I decided to take a second program that I had already been accepted to the year before. Um, started that program and thought, this is squash. I've already had business school over, over, over again. Um, I've already had a cohort, you know. So within two months, I said to myself, give yourself a one month plan. Um, look up a guy named Josh Dalton. It's called the two hour job search. So that's what I uh, adopted, which is you need to decide what companies you're interested in. Then you need to list out uh, the names of people that are in your network there and reach out. I did that plan, and then within a month, I had an offer from Lenovo and an offer from Genesis, both in sales, my career advisor, and my grad school. These career advisors are very important people. Um, she said, tech sales is not like regular sales. Like, you need to give it a shot. It is not cold calling. You know, you can go in there and use your analytical skills, you know, um, build out your skills from a technology standpoint, and it is a whole different ball game. And she was right. And that's how I got there. Sorry, that was long-winded. But great and useful, for sure. I'll restate the question to, to our last two um, panelists. Uh, how did you choose your career path? Um, and how do you think your identity shaped your choices and opportunities? So, Hello. Oh. Check, check. Oh. Hello. Oh. <laughs> Maybe I'm just. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I came to App as an accounting major. Um, I will say I didn't know anything about accounting even when I was in high school. Like I took an accounting class because I didn't want to take. My mom wouldn't let me take home ed, you know, where you get to take a kid home. So she was like, you're going to do accounting. You're like, you're good at numbers. This is your path. So I was like, got it. So did accounting and ended up, actually, I applied to two colleges. I applied to Clemson and I applied to App. And I got into App State. And when I was in high school, I was actually doing community college as well, just to kind of not take those gen ed classes. So when I got into App, I got into the first generation program. Um, if anybody is in it, access. So I was actually got into that program. And getting into that program kind of helped me keep my career path the same when it comes to accounting. Um, I got into the Walker College of Business, I think, my second year. Um, I was in app for three years. And then 
my junior year is what I call it, is when all of the firms kind of started coming in and they said, you know, just network. And I'm a people person, I like to talk. So that was easy for me, you know, just kind of talking, connecting. And they always said, App said, you know, you're interviewing the firms that are coming here. So that's what I did. I took it as an interview session. I'm interviewing big four firms that I had, you know, before coming to App, didn't even know what the big four was. And now I'm standing in front of like small spaces, having conversations about who I am and where I'm from. So it was the coolest thing. Um, and then was introduced to Cone Resnick and fell in love. I will say um, they're a great firm, uh, especially the people that uh, I met that came to App and kind of recruited me to the firm as well. Um, it was one of the best decisions I feel like that I made coming out. Um, I kept into auditing because you get into the audit group, you're in different teams. I'm a very teamwork oriented person, so audit was the perfect field for me. I got a 15 week internship where I could do audit and tax, but by the 10th week, I told the partner, I said, I am not going to the tax department. They are way too quiet over there. I'm just gonna stay in audit because you know those are where all my friends are. That's where my work is good at. I'm gonna stay in audit. Um, the only thing, only reason why I transitioned out of Cone Resnick is when it comes to the work-life balance that you want to have when you, you know, are getting older and getting into your career. Um, I will say I'm in my position now at Wells Fargo um, because of the flexibility. You know, I'm still in that audit track. I'm kind of doing similar work, but not really. I'm more into different auditing different business groups internally now, um, but I will say when it comes to the work-life balance and the flexibility, I definitely strive for to have that in the career that I am now. Hi, I'm sorry. Was the second part of the question about identities? I'm sorry. Yes. Okay, yeah. great. Um, hi, uh, my career field is actually human resources. Um, and I know that might get a, some of a visceral reaction from some of the people in the room, especially if you worked in a corporate environment. But what we do is really interesting because um, I'm a industrial organizational psychologist with a human resource management um, dual degree. So with that, we think about how the mind works in the workplace and um, how people work together, kind of like sociology and how we can better make your experience at work um, a little bit more enjoyable and hopefully a little bit more profitable as well. Um, so how I got into that, I minored in psychology. I read a book entitled um, The Other Westmore and it's about a man who, his name is Westmore and he is a very popular author and he is about to get his book on the bestsellers list and he's reading the paper one day and he reads that, um, it says Westmore is being imprisoned for life because of an armed robbery. And he read more into this because he's like, wow, this man has my same name. Um, and he le reads more and he finds out that they're from the same neighborhood. Um, and it really intrigued him about how these two people with the same name from the same type of neighborhood ended up in two very different spots in their life. And I think thinking about that and thinking about how two people can have such different experiences and how their two lives can lead to two different places. Applying that to the workplace I thought was really interesting because we spend so much of our life in the workplace. Um, and we kind of are in this corporate and we go to work and we come home and it's like, how can we make this really enjoyable for everybody and be, be inclusive and have people feel as if they belong with all of their different identities that they come to work with. And so, Coming from an HBCU, which is a historically black college or university, it's a little bit different than App. Um, I went to one of the biggest public HBCUs in the nation, and I feel as though the environment that they create there is inclusive and it is belonging. And I wanted to bring that environment that I experienced um, at 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 my HBCU to workplaces because you get in a workplace and sometimes you feel like you're being excluded because of a part of your identity, you feel like you don't belong there and you're, and you're kind of a part of an out group and you're feeling really bad and you don't do your best work. And that's like, that's not the best in my opinion. So I think taking that, my experience from HBCU, I wanted to recreate that culture for everyone in all of their identities in their workplace. And that's how my identity kind of ties in with my work. Uh, now. Wow, thank you all for sharing a glimpse into your stories. I think we can all see there's a lot of passion within each and every one of you. 
Um, so now moving along, I'm sure there's a lot of juniors and seniors in the room. Um, what do you look for in an organization and what are red flags or green flags you might notice, notice when assessing a potential employer? Oh. Um, so what I look for in potential uh, employers and even just organizations and institutions that we partner with and get involved with, and especially in the nonprofit space, um, and kind of with that mindset, um, what's your mission? Like, that's really big for me. Um, I, I understand you guys are business students, and so profit and all those things um, matter, and, and they do matter, but for me, I'm like, what's, your, what's the heart of your, your mission for your organization, for your employees, for your products, for your reputation? Like. What are you really putting behind that? Um, and some red flags for me, um, so I do a lot of hiring in regard, like recruiting and hiring for our agency um, and for the institution as well. Um, and with that, I've, I've talked to a lot of recruiters from other organizations, and a huge red flag to me, um, and I tell all of our students who are going into the workforce, like ask recruiters, what type of candidate are they looking for? And if organizations say to me, we'll take anybody, we need, we need bodies in the building, we need people um, to help us accomplish our tasks, but they're not really giving you specific, you know, we want critical thinkers and people who um, are compassionate and can make decisions and can work well with others. And what, if, you just, if you just want people, um, that's a huge red flag to me. Like, that tells me I, I'm not gonna matter to your organization. You're the person you're gonna hire to help me. Like, I'm gonna have to, you know, pick up their slack or whatever else. So um, that's a little piece of advice for red flags. If someone tells you like, we're, we need people to just help fill the spots, huge red flag for me. Um, to add on to that, so a green flag that pops out and you're really gonna get this information not from the recruiter, not necessarily from the manager. You need to reach out to people in those roles to really ask before you sign that line, you know, what's the environment like? So a green flag when I'm talking to someone in the company is, is it an open door policy? Do you feel like you have access to resources, right? Um, both from a human standpoint, like people being willing to connect and workshops and things, but also, you know, what kind of resources are already in play that are like hard and documented? Because if they're not, that needs to factor, in, factor into your negotiation, right? Because that means that your job is gonna be a little bit more harder or difficult. It could be good from a learning plan standpoint, but something to be mindful of. Um, another green flag for me is um, work-life balance. What I mean is um, most jobs in most industries have woes, you know, like, you know, two or three months, things are seamless. You can clock out at three technically, or, you know, things are coasting by three o'clock. And then at another two or three months, you're spinning and you can't go to bed without thinking about what else needs to be done. That's okay. Right, so when I say work-life balance, I'm not necessarily saying every day at five o'clock you're off. I'm saying when you uh, decide you wanna expand and have a family, what does that look like? You know, if you wanna put that off, are they offering anything for women, right? So that you can put that off a little bit further if that's what's needed in that type of industry. Um, um, again, how much time are they giving you when you do decide you wanna start your family? Um, um, other things I think about is for their DEI programs, what's it really doing? Are they going into the communities, going to the HBCUs, as she mentioned, and making sure that we get some heads in there? Or are we just having this as a, a label to check off a box, right? Um, I think that's also important to pay attention to. Um, a red flag? Mm, a red flag. I'm not sure about a red flag, but those are some green ones for me, for sure. Oh, when you're speaking to those peers, those people that will be your colleagues, um, ask them, have they given advice to their manager and how did the manager receive that advice? So is there an ability for you to give feedback? That's important, right? Now, most of it is gonna be the manager giving you feedback. Great, you're learning, you're growing. They're the you know more skilled people, or not more skilled, more seasoned in the role at the company, but it's also important for you to be able to bring your suggestions to the table also important to hear that they're okay with implementing new ideas, things like that. 
Yeah, I think assessing an organization is definitely important. Me personally, I go off of vibes. Um, I think uh, like with when you're talking about vibes in an organization, that's really important to me. Of course, somebody appreciating my talents and what I bring to the team and us doing like really high impact projects, but vibes are also really important it's for happiness. Um, and how I assess that in an organization specifically is during the interview. I feel like I'm a silly, goofy girl. I like to <laughs> try to keep my interview as upbeat as possible. I really show my personality during my interview. Of course, you want to remain professional um, so that you can actually uh, get in there. But I think showing your personality is incredibly important. Um, I like to, I, I feel like I had a good interview if I made it, my interviewers laugh. Um, and I'm like, okay, well, if they laughed, then the vibes are there. So we're, we're feeling good. Um, and I think that's really important. I have a really big personality. I love to laugh. I don't, um, I, of course, I take my work seriously. But of course, on the off time, I like to, you know, kiki with the coworkers sometimes. And I really like to see if that culture permeates. And you can really sense that through an interview, in my opinion. Because usually the people you're interviewing with are hiring managers who are really um, kind of in that corporate culture. Um, and I think they represent that really well. I also usually ask when I'm thinking about belongingness and inclusion, um, I ask any of my it, um, hiring managers, no matter what their identity is, how they f feel supported by their organization and how they feel their identity is represented, and if they feel like they, um, if they feel like they're comfortable in within their organization to speak out and be an advocate and do things like that. And that's usually one of my questions that I ask during the interview, which in, in, incites a lot of um, interesting conversation with me and the hiring manager as well, but I think those are some really great things for anyone to really employ is to make sure you're showing your personality to see if you mesh well with the culture at that organization. Um, I also would say to do a little research on like mission statements, although they may seem like a little bit of fluff, a lot of them uh, really speak to what the managers are thinking when they're creating policies and uh, talking about culture and things like that. I know I worked for an organization whose two, two of their um, two of their mission statement words were bold and fast. Um, it didn't really mesh well with my, uh, my working style and I can definitely feel that, that a lot of them, was, they're like super innovative and they like to do, be fast and really short with people instead of being like understanding and warm and feeling like they have a culture which works better for my working environment. So I would definitely say to do the research on that as well. Can I add one thing to that? That interview piece she just mentioned is big. So when you're just getting on the call, whether it's Zoom or a phone call, but more importantly, Zoom and in person, just sitting there waiting for them to ask you thing after thing after thing, by the time they get off, they're not gonna know much about you besides what they pulled out of you. So what you wanna think about is the fact that you get the, that you have the interview, that you have the chance to now communicate, you already fit the, you already fit the build, right? Or you have, you qualify, that's what I'm trying to say. You already qualify. So now they're looking for, who can I sit next to on the plane for two hours, right? So uh, one way to do what she's mentioning is to ask them some questions up front, not just waiting until the last five minutes. When you're having those back and forth of, you know, how was your day, da, 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 ask them more questions to probe about them, you know what I mean? Mix it in. Um, that's just another uh, suggestion to be able to show your personality. I was gonna say, I can add. Um, the biggest thing I would say is kind of like the interview. I'm a vibes person too. So like if the interview, I kind of, it's kind of like your first date, you know, if the interview is not, you know, if that first date, if you're getting like weird vibes, like this is a little bit off. Um, when I was going into my first uh, job and you know, we're doing all these interviews that you sign up for, to I did one interview where he sat and he asked me a bunch of math questions, like back to back to back. I will never forget this interview. And I'm pretty good at math, but I was sitting there in this interview thinking in my head, like, even if I knew the answers to these questions, like, what is this gonna tell you about myself, about these, these math questions that I'm answering? Like, I know two plus two equals four, but what is audit gonna <laughs> tell me about two plus two? Um, and from that, I even took it and said, this isn't for me, and then, I will never forget my other interview I had that kind of got me into audit. Um, I cheered when I was at App State. And so the first thing that I kind of talked about when I was in my interview was cheering. And they love App State football. So we started talking about App State football and cheerleading. And then 
kind of talking about how I got into cheerleading, and I had an interview with two men. So talking about cheerleading the two men is just, you know, it's a very interesting conversation, but seeing them very engaged, like, and learning who I was made me know that, like, okay, they want to know who I am and why I am the person I am today. You know, so you may not always, you know, your title is just your title, you know. my I'm a senior inter, uh, internal auditor, but, like, my background is so much more deeper than that. And I think that's what you need to realize, especially in interviews. And even when you're talking to your the, uh, the manager that you may be interviewing with, kind of get their background, too, because they may, you know, as far as when it comes to feedback, you need to learn how they're going to react to feedback as well. So that's just one thing I think about when it comes to picking the right place. Projects that your company like undertake and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I want to know uh, what diversity and inclusion initiatives has your company uh, undertaken, and do you think those have been effective? And I'd start with you. Um, yeah, so, ooh, okay. I'm actually gonna talk about the company um, that I worked for when I was living in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, they were a smaller company. Um, I was the HR assistant for it, and they didn't have a DEI statement or plan. Um, but what was really interesting was that I still felt really included and as if I belonged. Um, they had a very they like to still refer to themselves as a mom and pop, although they had 5,000 employees in different oil rigs on offshore plants. Um, but I think the important part, even with small organizations like that, it's really um, hard and time consuming and also costly to create a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement. But when the thought is there for your employees and understanding how your employees work, especially in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, I don't know if anyone has been there or um, is from Louisiana or anything like that, but the people love to party. They have a they have a festival for everything. They make a crawfish boil. So every other Friday, the HR department decided to do little parties. Everybody took a half day on Friday. Um, there was trulies and beers and things of that nature. So everybody really participated in those things. Um, it created like a lot of engagement there, and people were also encouraged to come into office on Fridays. Usually that was a day that everybody took off, but. If you came in, you know, you got a few drinks for free, got a little bit of food, there was always a theme and things like that. So I think understanding, um, it, when an HR department and an organization really understands the people that are working for them, the people that are in their organization, um, and seeing what works best for engagement and making you feel belonged and making sure that those conversations are happening within employees and when something does happen um, like that, that so when something does happen that may be against a diversity, equity, and inclusion program that it's addressed adequately. Um, I think that that's just as good as a huge billion dollar company having a really integrated DEI plan as well. Yeah, and at, um, at Wells Fargo, I, I love like a lot of the programs that I'm involved in too. So of course it's Black History Month and we've done a lot of diversity and inclusion this month. Like we had a HBCU luncheon and I think that's really nice. It's, it's more. It's bigger than just saying it's HBCU luncheon. You're kind of meeting with people that went to HBCUs. You can network with them, senior management, and these are people that you probably will never talk to outside of your department. Wells Fargo has four buildings in Uptown Charlotte, and so that's a really big company in, in Charlotte. So bringing us all together just for a luncheon is, is great networking. Um, I'm also in a sorority, so we'll have days where everyone will wear their letters to work, which I think is nice as well, because it's kind of networking. It's just figuring out where everybody went to different schools, kind of figuring out what sororities and fraternities, fraternities they're in. Um, I think it's just been a great, those are things that you, those are qualities and companies that you look for. Not as they're putting in these DNI programs as a hassle, they're actually putting in programs that are gonna make a difference. Um, another thing, like I have a mentor at Wells Fargo, and I had a mentor at another firm that I was at, and it looked like it was like a job for them to be my mentor, but at Wells, I'm actually very connected with my mentor. They know pretty much a lot about me. Um, it was really nice kind of going into a senior position getting a mentor because now you're managing other people, you know, going straight into audit, you're on an audit team and it's probably like, you know, 30 people on your team and you kind of do feel like another body, but now when you're in senior positions and get into management positions, now you are making a difference for people. So it's really nice to still have a mentor that can kind of, you can ask questions and they're always available, kind of like that open door, 
open door policy. Um, so in regards to diversity and inclusion initiatives, um, it's a very interesting, um, I guess, concept maybe for policing specifically, just on a society level, right? And so um, back in 2020, I believe, we started the, the diversity, inclusion, and community engagement unit with App State Police one of the first police departments in the nation to um, designate an entire unit for those initiatives and that purpose. So very proud of that um, and thankful for that. So one of our f first accomplishments that we wanted to do was um, put things in writing, right? So we created policies uh, and procedures in regards to diversity and inclusion and then increasing our training for all of our staff. So now all of our, our staff are required at least twice a year to get some type of DEI training. And so in the policy and training and management um, thought process, like I think that's, that's great because we're, like we're putting it in, in, on paper, right? Um, some initiatives that we've done that I think um, has been really amazing is increasing our women within the agency. So nationally, women represent about 12 to 13% of women in law enforcement. Um, and we at our about 40% women right now in our agency, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and we are uh, continuing to review our policies and procedures to make sure not only can we recruit women, but that we can retain them, right? Because I think a lot of organizations are all about recruiting women, recruiting people of color, but not actually putting the, the foundation and the policies and the practices into keeping them. Um, and so some of those policies look like being in a lactation space for our women who choose to uh, become mothers, um, having flexible work schedules so that if your kid has, if you got a teacher parent conference, you can actually go do that. Um, now it is, it can be a challenge with scheduling to make sure we can accomplish all those things, but that is our focus um, and some things we've been able to accomplish. So um, I'm very proud of that. And yeah, um, an initiative that I'd like to see in the future, um, and, and this realm of work, and even more just public service is more mentorship. Um, and more, like we, we get so busy all the time that we um, sometimes can neglect connecting with our peers and our colleagues and people out, even outside of our agencies um, in a way that's not work related. So I, I would like to see more um, just social time uh, and mentorship for our people who are coming into the organizations, um, whether they're in our organization or not, just more mentorship in general. Um, I definitely agree with that. I actually would not be here if it weren't for mentorship. So um, I had a mentor when I was in the third grade coming from, you know, single mom, you know, um, um, government assistance, that type of thing. And so when I got paired with the mentor, she literally is still in my life. Not to the same rate because her work is done, right? So she helped me um, tour school. She helped me with the majority of my college applications in terms of like editing and just, you know, just sometimes you just need an accountability partner to sit down with you and get it done. And uh, especially if you don't have parents that are um, able to do that. So uh, mentorship is very valuable. And because of that, even now in my work life, I'm always reaching out to people. And I don't even necessarily call them a mentor. I more just have a who to ping list. Who's good at this? Who's good at that? Who's good at this? And after you've reached out to them just a few times and start to you know, ask questions or share what happened in your day, next thing you know, you've built a relationship. So I mean, there's different levels of, of mentorship. But my bi biggest advice is don't hesitate to reach out to people, both in companies that you're interested in or in the companies that you join, because that is allowing for doses of mentorship being spread throughout. But to answer the question, so our DEI program is called GBEAM at Genesis. And you know, the tech industry is, in, is interesting, um, not different from many other inter industries, but of course when you join it, um, you know, I'm not walking into a meeting expecting to be, you know, one of 10. I'm lucky if I'm one of two on most meetings. And so what, the, um, what our GBEAM program does is they do offer mentorship. 
So I have some peers that have taken advantage of it and had great experiences. Um, and because of having good experiences, she even now serves on the GBEAM board. And what they, some of the other things they've done in terms of initiatives outside of the mentorship program is they have um, meetings and um, specific webinars focused on bringing in diverse talent. Now, outside of you know uh, being a minority, what they, what my company has done a good job on is in the last two or three meetings I was on that was all solutions consultants, there was a little bit over 50% women. And that was big. Like I remember pinging a person going, wow, we have a lot of new women hires. This is fabulous. So that was shocking. So they're, they're, they, are, um, they are making some strides, right? They are making some strides. But you know, I think in general, sometimes we let this, the issues exist, no doubt. The issues exist. But uh, the biggest thing you can do is not let that hold you back from reaching out, from um, giving feedback if you don't feel you're being treated appropriately. Um, or, and that could be in any instance, right? But anyway, I'm, I'm going off a tangent now, but that's some of the things that my company does from a DEI perspective. Thank you. You all are offering phenomenal advice. I wish I would have been taking notes this whole time. <laughs> but before we open up questions from the audience, I have a two-part question for you all. What is the most important advice you would give to students of color in particular setting out on their career path? And how can students work to use their privilege to address diversity and inclusion concerns, if not for themselves, for others? The first thing I'd say is go abroad if you're at all interested. If you even have a 5% interest, go abroad. Just to really expand just to expand, just to also understand what minorities look like in other places. You know, sometimes you can feel like the victim, and don't get me wrong, you know, again, everything is what it is and we all know. But then when you expand and you get outside of your comfort zone, you also can meet others that have had similar experiences so that you feel less victimized, so that you don't let that depict your life moving forward. You know, a short example, um, I was in the Holland Fellows program here when I studied here uh, my senior year. Holland Fellows, they choose 10 students from the College of Business. At the time, it was Walker. Now it's Peacock, I believe. And then they choose 10 students from Fudan University in China. Well, the one student that I bonded with really closely and I still communicate with here today, and she's met my kid, and we, you know, visit each other on a regular basis. Um, we were sitting in the back of the bus in D.C., and she told me that she was a minority. She's a Wuger, which is a minority in China. Now, if you would have asked me back then at the age of, I don't know, 18, 19, um, are there minorities in China? I would have said yes just out of taking a good guess, right? Assuming maybe some people from Russia moved in. Maybe some people from other, some, from other Asian countries moved there. But I would not have actually been able to tell you what the Chinese minority looks like. And so we really bonded on that, on the fact that, you know, as a Uyghur in China, you know, I don't know if you all know, but there's like concentration camps and they're definitely trying to take them backwards. So it was a bonding moment. And what that does is it just lets me know that I'm not alone in this. I'm not the only one that lives in a country and doesn't feel necessarily raised and praised. So um, I'd say that's very, very important. But um, getting back to the question, my biggest piece of advice is as I've been saying, is to network. It's just to ask questions. Go on LinkedIn, look for other App State alumni, and if they're in the spaces that you're interested in, reach out. Reach out to 10, reach out to 20 a day. I guarantee, in my grad school, um, it's Fuqua uh, School of Business out of Duke University, 60% of the people that found jobs on a ro each on a rolling year basis, they found it from networking, not from uh, submitting an application blindly. So that's one uh, piece of it. That's probably my largest piece of advice as you are approaching um, your next steps and your journeys after college. And not just to find a job though, right? Like take the job aside. Maybe you want to be an entrepreneur. Maybe you want to start a podcast. Maybe you want to create a soccer team in some numbuck town that you're now living in and you're like, where are the people? I miss college. 
reach out to people. Well, how did you start? I see that you have this Taekwondo thing going on. You know, what, what allowed you to like rally up some people to do this? So whether it's for personal gain of like building hobbies, keep those hobbies when you graduate. Um, or if it's, you know, entrepreneurship, or if it's getting into another organization that already exists, reach out. That's like my biggest piece of advice. Is there a second part to that question? On the flip side, be open. So now that I have been able to get into certain doors by talking to people, every time a student, an alumni, and I get mostly people reach out from my grad school versus my undergrad, so hint, hint, reach out. But um, when they reach out, I make time. I make time. So my advice is make time, pay it forward. Anything that has benefited you so far in your life, you need to be ready to pour that back out to others. That's the biggest um, piece of advice is treat others the way you, you know, it's a long way of saying treat others the way you want to be treated, but make time and talk to people and answer questions and try to treat um, people a, at all different uh, levels of their life the same way. You know, treat everybody with a certain respect. Um, I think the first part of this question is what advice would we give to students stepping out in their career? Um, and my advice to p young people or people just changing careers in general, um, or I don't know, for me, like when I was getting ready to graduate, I'm like, I know I'm going to do something. I know I'm going to do something great, but I don't know exactly what that's going to be yet. Um, and it's okay if you don't have it all figured out. And so my biggest advice is, um, I know, you're young, you're active, you're capable of doing all these things, but it's okay. It's okay to take your time. It's okay if you don't have everything figured out right now. It's okay if your plans change <laughs> two years from now. Um, you know, if you're going from being a band teacher to a police officer, like, it's okay, you know? Um, so I think that that's something that's really important to know because I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to be successful and be motivated, which leads to having conflicts with work-life work balance because we're going all in at work and going all in on all these things. So it's okay, like, you'll get there, you know. You know, be, be intentional, but don't, don't overdo it. Um, another thing, like you said, get connected. Um, I, a lot of times, especially in the corporate world, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Um, so. Make sure you're networking. Use every opportunity that you engage with someone or interact with someone. It's an interview opportunity. Whether you're talking to a peer, a potential employer, if you are the employer who's now looking at um, t to hire people, every interaction, uh, look at it as an interview opportunity. So if I see someone you know, at lunch, I'm like, how are they interacting with the wait staff? How are they you know, interacting with people that they're at the table with? So be aware of that, like everything you do can be an inter interview process. Um, yeah, and then um, how to use your privilege to address diversity and inclusion concerns, if not for yourself, but for others. Be willing to, to take the upper road, right? Like if you have the ability to make a difference for someone, stand up for someone, not in a space where you're gonna be in an unsafe space for yourself, right? But it's okay to um, address something on behalf of someone or just listen to them, right? Give them a safe space to vent or to connect or ride on the back of the bus with them, just explain their story. Uh, be, be willing to, to be that um, and be willing to, to step up if you feel like there's something that needs to be addressed. Like that. Um, what advice would I give stepping out into career? Um, my biggest thing is network. You know, we probably said it before, networking, um, patience, and keep going. There's gonna be doors that are gonna be closed in your face that you thought that this opportunity was gonna be for you. Um, you're gonna sit and say, I prayed for this and I knew this was gonna happen, and that door is still probably gonna get shut in your face. Um, I think the biggest difference that it's gonna take for you is how you overcome it and that perseverance that you continue to take. 
like we've always said, your plans are going to change. Um, you never, you know, you can have your whole life mapped out, um, and it could change in any second, and then you can have a whole different idea of what you want to do with your life. Um, so my biggest thing is keep going, don't give up, and you're, you're never going to have it figured out. I think that's what we need to always know. You're not going to have it figured out. You you may have the perfect grades, like you may, but you're going to still get into that space and still not know. Like You're still going to apply for that job. You're going to get in that position, and you're still going to have to go through training because you're still not going to know. And even though you said, oh, I have learned about this career my entire life, you won't know, and that's OK. So that's one thing I'd definitely say. Like, you know, it's OK to be open to learning new things as well. Um, and then use your voice. Um, always use your voice. If you see something that you feel like you can make a difference, do it. Um, don't be scared. Um, I feel like we're all put on this earth to leave a legacy, like leave a lasting impression. But it's up to you to figure out how you leave your legacy in this world. So everyone's going to leave their footprint. You know, you have your digital footprint. Um, but when it comes to your actual footprint that people are going to remember you by, you know, think of how you're going to do that. And if it, you can think small or big. Small is like, my small thing is every time I shake hands with somebody, I like give them a little tap on their elbow. Um, and not like it's a big thing, but like you may remember like, why did this girl just tap me on my elbow randomly while she shook my hand? But hey, you may, you're going to remember me when you talk about your, uh, talk about me to your friends, like this girl tapped me on my elbow. Um, and then also, I think I said it earlier, like, um, by day, you know, I work in the corporate life. I'm an internal auditor. That's my corporate lifestyle. Um, and then by night, I actually, I, I own a cheer gym in Charlotte. Um, and it took me a while to get there. Um, the building that I have is 5,000 square feet. And if I am 27 years old, I got it when I was 26, but I'm 27. So imagine somebody wanting to sign over a 5,000 square foot building over to someone that like looks like me, you know, I didn't think that I could do it. I had those doors that were shut in my face. Um, in December of last year, I said that I was going to open up the gym. And what we're sitting in February, it took me a whole year. I got seven rejections from people that just said, you know, you're not qualified. I don't believe in that. What are you doing? It was so many rejection letters. Um, and then it comes back to networking, because my realtor that finally got me the building is actually an App State alum as well. So it comes back to those networking. And I actually found him through LinkedIn. On, I saw he went to App, saw he was a realtor, and just reached out and said, I need your help. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I don't even know if this is for me. But I kept going, patience, perseverance, and put my mindset to it. And in December, I will never forget, December 11th, uh, the, the landlord, he reached out to me. He said, you know, like, this is a really big project for you to take on. You know, this is huge. But, you know, I believe in you, and I know you're going to do it because you're still here. Every document he wanted me to provide, everything I had to go through, every task, I made sure I did it. Um, even when the bank told me no, I figured out a way to do it. Um, and then December 11th, I actually got the building. And then we moved in officially 1-1 of this year. So it's like, keep going. It took a whole year. You know, I didn't think that I was going to do it. But keep going. Those doors are going to shut. Look for that uh, work with work-life balance, because I definitely have work-life balance 100% with my work life. Um, but yeah, that's my biggest advice. Keep going. Use your voice. You're going to make a difference le and leave your legacy. Um, yeah, my biggest advice to, was it students of color? Or? OK, my biggest advice specifically to students of color would definitely be to advocate for your boundaries. And that is like. Stand, you have to stand on business. Like, I think that once something happens and you feel uncomfortable, especially in your workplace, that is not acceptable, specifically coming from HR. Um, if you find, like, find someone in your HR department, you feel like something was said, something was done to you, like, if you're feeling uncomfortable, go to your D, like, there's, I'm sure there's a DE and I advocate if you go to a bigger um, organization or an HR, um, person that may um, make you feel comfortable, like go there and speak to them about what happened to you. Not only will that help the organization move forward with their DE&I policy, but it'll make you feel better that you told somebody because there may be actions taken. Um, and you're standing on business about your boundaries, especially in the workplace. Um, and I like to tell the cohort a lot of the times that 
I am not the Lorax and I do not speak for the trees. And sometimes for people like being an advocate and making noise and making um, a lot of, like putting in a report like that is an uncomfortable, um, is being put into an uncomfortable position. But I would still say to stand on business about your boundaries. And if a organization, if you don't feel comfortable going forward about something that happens in your organization um, as it relates to DEI, then maybe that organization is really not for you. And like your boundaries should not be pushed and you should not be feeling uncomfortable in your workplace because of uh, the environment that you're in. Um, specifically also to the um, students with privilege, I think was the second part of the, yeah. Yeah, I, I think the same advice applies. Being an advocate and being being an ally and having strategic advocacy when it comes to being in positions of power, especially in your workplace. When you notice something, um, you see something that may have made a coworker uncomfortable, a comment about like your, maybe you, you might be in a group of men and that makes a really weird sexist comment. Like being an advocate in those spaces too when the person is absent, the person who the comment was about is absent in that conversation I think speaks louder um, than a lot of other sit situations and instances. Being able to be an advocate even when nobody is around to listen to you and HR is not around and your boss isn't really around, but being in those spaces and really understanding perspective, I think is when those conversations and when your allyship means the most. Like being like, hey, I don't think that was funny. Can you explain the joke to me ex like explicitly? Like, and really telling, being an advocate in those spaces and um, asking those questions to people who make comments a bit that make a workplace like really uncomfortable. Um, in that same breath, like when we're talking about being an ally and having advocacy, I think being aware of unconscious bias and also perspective taking is incredibly important, especially when you're at an identity um, where you're in a position of power. Um, having unconscious bias is a natural human thing like I grew up in the inner city of Philly and I was um, unaware of a lot of things that may happen to some of my cohort members in the Midwest. Like those are two, su those are such two different experiences. And there's a lot of things that I had to learn like about culture and uh, about um, the, my cohort members and the kind of lives they, li the lives they lived. Um, and I think it's so important taking those perspectives and taking all of those in and listening to people about about their grievances and about how they feel about a situation because even if you do think you're right in a situation somebody ha somebody's feelings are hurt and i think listening to them and seeing where they're coming from is incredibly important especially when you're um in that position of power and i think that's being a really good ally too like not being put on the defensive um and not thinking like oh well that's that's like of course that's not how i think but like words your impact may have been different than the intention there. Um, and I think that's really, really important to think about, especially when we're talking about like diversity, equity, inclusion in the workplace and how you can be a really good ally and how you can um, align yourself with a policy like that. Like I said, I think advocacy and allyship is really important. Can I add one more thing? Um, as a person of privilege, another thing that you can do is, even if there's nothing wrong going on, right? So let's talk about what some of these rooms look like, right? So maybe you have a team of eight. Let's say probably five are white men, depending on the industry. Maybe one is a black male or woman. Um, one is another ethnicity, and then one is maybe a white woman. When um, what happens is you may naturally draw more to these other white men because y'all are interested. I'm not interested in Star Wars. I'm not interested in, you know, you name it, whatever it may be, right? I'm not watching it, I'm not interested. When I first started my career in finance, I would have acted interested, meaning I would have asked more questions and tried to go look up on it or try to go watch a little bit more football or try to go listen to some other artists. But at this stage, I don't want to have to do that. So don't make me do that. So here's the deal, what you can do, right? There's no issue, right? There's not an issue presented. So what you can do is, when you naturally want to pair up with that other buddy or other two buddies, that you're more comfortable with to do a workshopping session, still include that ostracized person. Not that you're intentionally ostracizing, excuse me, ostracizing them, but what you can do is still invite them and don't even expect them to join in on the, the extra chit chat. Still have your extra chit chat. Still do be you, but still invite that extra, per that, uh, that person that is probably does not have, you know, 
somebody that they're like super camaraderie with, if that makes sense. That is something that you can do on a day-to-day -day basis. Be mindful of that person that's sitting over to the side, right? Uh, meanwhile, you have your group of people, invite them in. Even if they're awkward, don't have any expectations. My sister used to tell me, when you go into a room of people that maybe, you know, you don't know what to expect, you greet and then you have no expectations of how they greet you. You just greet, you've greeted, boom. So apply that same, you know, uh, methodology. Invite them in, in spaces, and be aware that there's a reason that they're on your team, and just be kind, and maybe go the extra mile. We have time for a few questions, or should we just? If not, they've been talking about the importance of networking, and we will transition in a few moments into a little bit of a networking time. Um, but first, thank you all so much for being here. Let's give them a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you all for sharing your unique experiences and advice with all of us. I know it's been super helpful. Um, and now we will have Dr. Mesnar come on with some closing remarks. Technology is not my strong suit by any means. Oh, I'm so glad this is working and I don't have to figure out how to turn it on. Though we received training before the session on how to turn this on, which was very welcome. My name is Marty Mesner. I'm an associate dean in the Walker College of Business. Uh, my area is global and civic engagement, so I've had for several years the opportunity to be involved in these courageous conversations and some of these events where we try to create these spaces where we can have dialogue instead of argument where we can think about things a little more deeply and more individually than making generalizations and stereotyping and doing these other things that often lead to negative, uh, negative outcomes. I would just like to echo one short uh, bit of advice that was heard uh, here this evening, go abroad. I, I was uh, born abroad and raised abroad and I think that has helped me so much in trying to evaluate the society in which we live and the strengths and weaknesses of America, American culture that are both. But if you can look at things from the outside back in and think critically about it, you get so much insight from traveling abroad. So thank you very much for the advice that you have provided us. I think that's, that's, that's great. Um, thank you, Javon, Amaya. You did an outstanding job as moderators. I was very impressed with the questions as well. These were not light, fluffy questions and simple answers. These were uh, thought-provoking uh, questions. Thank you for handling it so well. And of course, uh, our, our panelists, uh, Mariah, Cache, Tajia, Kwani, your insights were very valuable to us. And thank you, and thank you for being willing not just to give advice, but be accessible for uh, students that want to come back to you. It's very, a very uh, powerful and motivating example that you're willing to take time out of your busy schedules to be here with us and help us. And uh, those of us in twilight years of our careers appreciate just as much as those of you starting out, I'm sure, uh, that you were willing to do that for us. Now, I have somewhere here some notes about what's coming up that I'm supposed, I'm entrusted to communicate to you guys. Well, it's misplaced trust. Uh, I think many of you want to scan a card to record your presence. I think, uh, oh, it's uh, like mine. Uh, so I think I'm, I'm okay. But there's a card scanning outside uh, by the side exit. Then you go around for, for food. So don't forget to get your card signed. Uh, want to be very uh, responsible about that. Um, you'll see that there are tables kind of scattered around here. The panelists will be sitting at these tables. And if you want to continue the conversation, it's a great chance to delve in a little more deeply into some of the things that might be on your mind. So you're encouraged to hang around and participate in that conversation uh, with them. Uh, we are having a, a reception that's being catered by uh, Big Bros's Barbecue, uh, a locally owned uh, company operated by an App State alumnus, Ambrose Young. 
Uh, there will be, you know, I, I learned the menu this afternoon, and I have been salivating about the banana pudding specifically. But there will be wings, veggies, banana pudding, sweet tea. Please help yourselves. I think they're still not quite set up out there, so you'll be forced to do a little network and conversation before you uh, jump into the, the more tasty part of the evening. And in the spirit of uh, continual uh, education, lifelong learning, I learned something today that I would like to share with you uh, in this same vein. Uh, this is an almost zero waste event. Here at App, one of the big things that we try to do is be sustainable, be, be aware and concerned and respectful of our natural environment. Uh, it's almost zero waste because the plates, bowls, spoons, forks, napkins, and food can all go into compost bins, as you see different bins where you can put stuff out there. However, cups and ramekins will not be compo compostable. Now, what I ask you, and I asked myself this afternoon, in the world is a ramekin? Well, so I Googled it, and now for all of you who like to you know, continue to learn, ramekins, according to Google, or at least one site on Google, are an elegant relative to the common bowl. So, so please, your ramekins are not recyclable. They'll end up uh, in the thing. You probably could call them a bowl, but it is a university setting. We'll stick with ramekins as our descriptive form. Thank you all for being here. Uh, in the end, if, you'd never, if nobody showed up, this would still be fascinating, valuable, but the benefits uh, and the thought provoking wouldn't happen on the same scale. So we appreciate you being here. Enjoy conversation eventually enjoy food. And what I've forgotten to say, Meredith will gladly, re oh yeah, on the tables over here, there are some name tags. Now, there are no names on them because we don't know who would be sitting where, but there will be pens where you can put your name on them and attach them to your shirt or sweater so that we can kind of converse on a first name basis. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> See you next time.